so much. Thank you, John. Thank you for joining us today. I hope everyone is home safe in the snow. Um, my name is Stacy Cleish. I'm a past president of AIA New Jersey, and today I'm here representing our Public Awareness Committee. This is the Contract Interior Design in a Post-Pandemic World webinar. This course has been approved for 1.5 HSW AI learning units. I just got the message yesterday, so you get a little bump up. Um, you do not need to do anything to get your credits. They will be processed for you by AI New Jersey after you submit your survey, which you should be receiving probably on Monday or Tuesday of next week from AI New Jersey. Um, we also will be tracking uh, your participation today, so please remain on the webinar for the one hour duration. Thanks. Today's program, Contract Interior Design in a Post-Pandemic World. The COVID-19 pandemic has risked the public's health and safety in buildings across the globe. This program is intended to provide elected officials, government employees, design professionals, allied professionals, employers, building owners, facility managers, and the public with resources for reducing risk when reoccupying buildings during pandemics and in developing safer, more healthy buildings and work experiences in the future. Expert panelists include award-winning registered architects and designers who specialize in contract interior design. The panel will discuss short-term and long-term changes to the physical workplace and work process itself that have come about in response to the pandemic work from home orders, including what functions will likely return to the workplace and those that may not. Program content will provide processes and strategies for pro protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the public and the employees while resuming services. Our learning object objectives have been filed with AIA National for your credits. And I'd like to introduce our speakers. I can assure you that although I'm reading slides that our speakers <laughs> will not be reading off of slides for the duration of the program. Uh, our first presenter, is, or actually our third presenter, uh, but first in alphabetical order is Edmund Klimek from a partner at KSS Architects. Ed's passion for the architecture of commerce, designing places that bring people together in the grand endeavor of the economy. Working closely with clients as both designer and trusted advisor, he's helped to create visionary places for work and industry. Collaboration is the cornerstone of Ed's architectural approach. He thrives in leading large complex teams through a process driven by a dedication to exceptional design that draws upon his unique skills of all its members. Ed is an endeavor in his, is an innovator in his field. His clients are invite, have invited him to speak at national corporate gatherings. He's been a frequent contributor at national industry conferences. He's lectured at MIT and other higher education institutions. Ed is passionate about sustainability and social equity. He's won grants to study sustainable industrial development and well design in distribution. He has been a consultant to the United States Green Building Council and is working on the integration of UN SDGs into design practice. He's currently pursuing a degree in global development and social justice at St. John's University in New York. Ed has been a partner at KSS since 2000 and has over 35 years of experience. Ed is licensed in 20 states, earned his Bachelor of Architecture at the University of Detroit, and is a speaker for NIOP, the Urban Land Institute, and other allied organizations. Thank you for joining us, Ed. Our second speaker will be Mark Labou, Associate AIA, Workplace Strategy Director at Studio Eagle. Mark's extensive 25 years of experience in the field of interior design begins at the planning stage. He believes that the success of any design project is the outcome of an in-depth and thorough strategic plan initiative, understanding the ways in which teams interact with each other, the behaviors represented in given spaces, and the functions certain environments are expected to provide is a critical focus for the solutions he can offer his clients. Through the methods of programming, space utilization, and occupant observations, he's able to map out a path forward to the corporations he services. The analysis he provides reveals strategic ways in which businesses can provide in, uh, businesses can improve employee engagement, productivity, and efficiency, enhance branded messaging, attract and retain talent, and foster team collaboration and growth. Creative problem solving comes naturally to Mark. 
This occurs by his careful listening to the client team and understanding their challenges and pain points. He has the ability to articulate his vision, presenting thought provoking questions and offering up new perspectives and ideas that improve functionality while promoting change and user experience in the workplace. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Our uh, third presenter is Karen Nichols, FAIA Principal at Michael Graves Architecture and Design. Since joining Michael Graves Architecture and Design in 1977, Principal Karen Nichols, FAIA, has played a key role in developing the firm's hallmark integrated practice in planning, architecture, interior design, product design, experiential design, graphics, and branding. She has extensive experience in master planning, programming, and front end planning. She regularly collaborates with the firm's other principals and designers on a wide variety of projects for corporate hospitality, healthcare, educational, cultural, and governmental clients. Workplace planning and design feature prominently among Karen's accomplish accomplishments. Over many years, she has seen the transformation of the workplace from the days when she master planned and programmed the Walt Disney headquarters in Burbank, California, and the NCAA headquarters in Indianapolis in 2000, to her more recent experience with a Fortune 100 company's real estate portfolio. Over the past six years, she's been the project executive and front end planner for workplace transformation for a national financial services company and several institutional clients. She's overseen 2 million square feet of new construction and renovation in eight cities throughout the United States, ranging in scale from 10,000 square feet to over 600,000 square feet each. In addition to designing the architecture, interiors, and signage, our multidisciplinary team participates in real estate selection, develops facilities programs and workplace standards, spearheads technology master plans, and participates in the client strategies for operations and employee experience. And I will be your moderator today. Uh, I will be fielding questions at the end of today's program. And I am the um, person who has put together our series for AIA New Jersey's post-pandemic design webinar program. We hope that you have had the opportunity to participate in our past programs. We have three additional programs scheduled for 2021. They will be on warehouse, um, transportation, and historical properties. So please look for those dates coming up in January, February, and March. And the remainder of our programs will be posted on our YouTube channel. So if you have not had the opportunity to participate, hopefully you will uh, be able to catch up on the webinars there. And that takes us through our front section. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and introduce Mark as our first speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. So I think by now we have all really been immersed in understanding coronavirus and how to protect it. But what we aren't really understanding and learning about every day is the effect that it's had on businesses. So, you know, it's taken a hit on all different companies. Offices are empty. Uh, retail is lagging. Uh, they're closing. Hospitality has been hit pretty hard. Uh, real estate is slow, deals are on hold. So what we're really trying to understand is, you know, how do we get back to populating the streets again? And so for the past six months or so, we've really been starting to see literally a trickle coming back to the office. And the trickle, you know, culminates into different needs. Those that might be uh, the leadership team representing the business, uh, some might be those that are just, you know, challenged to get a Wi-Fi signal or need some concentration. Um, how do we get it to be further? How do we get it back to the way life was before March? I kind of bucketed my conversations around, you know, purpose, learnings, actions, and considerations. Why do we even have an office? It's really to enforce a company's brand, drive culture, increase productivity, attract and retain talent grow revenue, and perhaps the biggest one is to provide casual collaboration. Uh, I think for the most part, we've all been zoomed out. Everything needs to be scheduled and orchestrated. Uh, we're lacking just the uh, you know casual collisions we used to have amongst each other around the hallways, around workstations, uh, to just streamline communication and get the answers we need. And the email probably isn't the best vehicle, so we're exhausting Zoom. We're exhausting, you know, channel chats to get the answers that we need. So we really need to kind of 
get back to the office um, when it feels right for everybody. So what have we learned? There's a whole host of literature, news articles out there about, you know, what's so critical to success? Will offices even be the same? What should we be thinking? Uh, we're even starting to see the hospitality industry open their doors and provide, you know, an opportunity for professionals to use literally uh, hotel rooms for collaboration, for the Wi-Fi. So it's really interesting to start to see how some of these analogous industries are trying to flex their muscle and provide support for us as we are you know, challenged in these times. Again, the real genesis behind an office is the social interactions, working back into the environment, boosting morale. So we're starting to see that some of those percentages as we work from anywhere, it's kind of shifted from the work from home model to work from anywhere uh, is low because we're, we're just lacking each other. We're lacking, you know, getting back into the culture. So how do we, you know, consider doing that? Um, it's interesting for business leaders, it's, you know, instilling confidence. And I'm very much an advocate to listen and hear very closely, you know, what our teams are saying, what are they needing in this time, to know how to solution and provide. And that's, that's what's so unique about, uh, you know, myself, Karen and Ed is that as solution providers, we are that, that ear for you to, to share that voice. Some of the things that we're doing now, and it's really interesting how the timing of the pandemic hit the jobs in which we were starting to, you know, get to a certain percentage. Um, we have been fortunate to receive, you know, some new work in this time, but we had projects going prior to needing to shut down in March. So I, I'm trying to paint the contrast here of a very dense occupied workspace on the current side where we're very close together. Um, distance wise, we might not be within that six foot boundary. Those, these radiuses are expressing that they are. How do we need to pivot to respond to the employees needs as we learn about them? It starts to lend an opportunity where we could use the asset of our building in a different fashion. We could start to break up workstations if we're sensing that holistically and more of a, a, an ongoing process, there's gonna be a hoteling component where we don't need to provide seats for everybody. So we could start to break up and free space up. Uh, flexibility, again, that word about understanding how can we support those teams could start to speak to what the future holds and providing support in that vein. The other interesting part is understanding, again, where their temperatures are in terms of need. And it starts to imagine itself, or certainly could, about a shift schedule, a shift model, where certain teams are coming back into the business for different needs on certain times of the week. And we wanna be careful that we're providing support to them. Um, they're getting the resources that they need, whether they're interpersonal or uh, you know, company related. So that's kind of you know, what we're thinking about in this moment of time is you know, how does that work on a more holistic ongoing effort? If we focus a little bit more on the future side, we're seeing and hearing a lot of different things that can really propel us to get back to the office in the fashion that we knew. As professionals, we thrive off of each other and we're limited to do that in this time. So how can we do it safely? How can we do it, you know, maybe perhaps in a different way? Um, I certainly believe that we have learned so much of each other and of our teams in this almost year's time of how we've balanced and been successful or challenged or limited uh, in this work from home, work from anywhere model. So can we start to look at the environment and say, how can we get back to collaboration similarly to how we knew it or in a different fashion? So does it open up the opportunity for flexible seating, ability to project, ability to you know, collaborate on whiteboards, out in the open, not necessarily within an environment? Um, I have certainly understood from my clients that if there's not a phone booth component, like we're seeing in the lo lower left-hand corner, or an opportunity to take not only personal calls, but professional ones, where do they go to do that? They're doing them out in the common corridors. They're doing it into uh, someone's private office if it's vacant or a meeting room. They're monopolizing. They're taking away the asset of others. So can we start to bring that back into the environment to lend support, to lend well-being back to the employees in the environment. 
uh, the idea around pods is an interesting one where we can start to understand is that the needs for the teams to feel safe, to feel protected, to know that there is someone nearby throughout the day, but they are within their own environment and it is clean, it is comfortable, it has all the needs that they uh, require to do their profession, uh, but it's their own environment and it's not been used. So we have started to really, you know, kind of see that propel a little bit forward. And then I would say, you know, putting my own shoes in, in, in the mix of how I have managed work from home. As long as there's Wi-Fi, as long as there's a professional setting, I could literally work anywhere. And I have expressed that and done that uh, in the office. Our, our space is a little bit unique on the, on the design side where we can do just that. We would love to see how we can express that for our clients in a more relaxed setting. And that's what the lower right-hand corner is meant to exemplify. Can we collaborate? Can we distance in a safe way? Can we share ideas and really almost like move meetings faster than kind of the pop and circumstance of, of a you know, more formal conference room setting? Can we do it out in an open environment? Does someone listening to our conversation on a peer side spark another idea? They might not even have been invited to the meeting, but they actually almost gave us the answer. So it is, this is a really, really unique moment in time where we can you know, start to reimagine our workspace differently and bring people back into the environment that they once knew. We have certainly seen you know, the ways that we can keep our workspaces safe by partitioning them. Um, they might stay a little bit longer than we desire. Uh, and you're seeing kind of do two contexts here, uh, an opaque and uh, a transparent one. Uh, through conversation, through feedback of our clients, of our employees, of our teams, this might need to kind of be the answer for them to get back into the office. And we really need to respond to that and support them in that manner. Uh, we have been you know, talking about ways in which to keep ourselves safe. And this is one of those moments where, where you know, we have expressed uh, our abilities to provide sanitary stations, a little bit more aesthetically pleasing in our professional uh, interior design projects that aren't, they don't look so cumbersome. They don't look like we bought them off of a website. Uh, they're very tasteful. We'd love to kind of see if this has a little bit more of a propelling movement to live longer in the workspace. Uh, if I had to imagine that what we have learned in this time, it's about constantly washing our hands, being safe, being mindful of each other. So this is something that we can certainly start to, you know, bring into the environment to keep ourselves healthy and safe. There's also the idea about a frictionless path. And I, and I kind of dance around this carefully because I don't want it to come off to our client base that it feels orchestrated, that you're telling me in the fashion of how I need to kind of navigate. But it's actually really interesting if we take a look closely about what feels safe, what feels comfortable. Are we seeing some environmental graphics more a little lifelong in on the left hand side where we can literally come in from the entrance to one's workspace, you know, safely travel. We're not colliding into each other because that could be you know, concerning to others. Um, whether we are masked or not, I think it kind of boils down to company policy at, at certain times as we go uh, you know, with 2021 on the horizon. But it's really interesting how we can start to create intelligent solutions for a frictionless path that makes everybody feel comfortable. And I know, and I say this very honestly, what has worked so well for our team at Studio Eagle to come back into the office was instilling the confidence in the efforts that we did for them, as well as anyone that really knocks on our door. It could be the mail person, it could be a vendor dropping off material. What are they meant to understand and expect from the time they set foot in front of our door? It's conveying that language of safety and security. So here are some considerations to you know, kind of put out there. For a while, for a very long while, the, the model, the idea of activity-based workplace has been in the hands, in the minds of designers um, such as myself. And it's, it provides a lot of wealth and a lot of support. It's certainly you know, the sharing of ideas. It lends itself to flexibility. It provides a little bit more mobility, gives choice, it gives, the person the 
the vehicle the license to make choice on their own. Uh, it supports efficiency. Um, and it's, it's a different setting. What's really interesting is if we look at some of our analogous industries, they are similar to the ways that we function throughout the day, how we shop at some of our retailers. You're not walking to the environment and doing everything at one time. You're not shopping, paying, you know, checking prices. You go to certain stations, whether it is uh, the orchestrated path at Ikea or our grocery stores, even our service centers. When you check your car in for service, you're going to different moments within the environment to do different things. And I think there's a very strong relationship of how we can look at that in a different way now of how that might be the answer, how that might be the ways in which our teams, our companies can get the lights back on in a, in a more fuller fashion, in a higher occupancy fashion of how we can imagine certain environments lending support to do different things. This is certainly an example of a very flexible environment. And one might look at it and say, it's a little casual. What is it telling me? The idea and the benefit of natural light, as much natural light as we can get within an existing environment, flooding is strong. The idea of biophilia, nature, uh, water, comfort, gives our senses, our senses the support that we need to feel calm, to feel focused, to feel professional. The smell, the aroma of coffee in the background keeps us fueled. The chatter in the foreground of other people working motivates us to keep going. We've kind of been siloed in this moment where Zoom is really our only vehicle to connect and we're missing each other. We're, 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 we'd love to like work off of each other. And on a professional side, you know, those that are really, you know, graduating and coming in, into our industry, um, accelerating their profession, they didn't, they didn't look to graduate to, to work off of Zoom. They came to come to an environment. So we can really start to uh, open those doors again and give them that support. So this model is a really interesting one that really speaks to how we could look to position companies to open the doors again and find a right balance. It really is a balance. We could start to extract elements beyond, you know, of this context, of this image, and what applies to, to certain clients, to certain industries, uh, weighing what might have never been imagined in the past, what might have been experimented with but failed and to know why. So on the, on the strategic side, my brain is always thinking, you know, how can we leverage ourselves in a different way uh, for the support of the occupants? So this is really, again, making that relationship between the activity-based model to a more hybrid model. And the hybrid, I think, is really going to be, you know, ongoing about how and where people's positions, their temperatures, if you will, sit in a workplace. Are they coming in the office a couple of times a week and then the balance is somewhere else? Or are they hoteling for certain periods of the day and then going off to clients? So based on your industry, based on your role, we're seeing a whole host of those different activities, but for end users and, and employers to understand and support the hybrid model, uh, is really something I think that would be very fruitful for their in their direction. And then just to round out, um, again, what I have really found to be so successful is talk to your team, ask them questions, listen carefully, learn where their temperatures are, their positions are, so that you can provide a plan. And then start to experiment with that plan. And it is really an experiment. It's understanding and vetting what is and isn't working and then provide support and measure those efforts that were done to understand how best to pivot. And that's something that we do very well uh, at my organization about lending some support for our clients in the best fashion that, that makes sense for them. Over to you, Stacy. Okay, Karen, you can start sharing your screen. Yeah. There we go. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, good. 
Good. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's a snowy day like today. It actually feels good to be at home, working from home. Um, so I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit, uh, pivot off some of the things that, that Mark was, was speaking about, talk about some of the aspects of, of a current workplace and also some of the planning ideas and techniques that we can use to address not only um, today's situation, but in the future, the future of the workplace. So for us, we've always thought as architects that the office, the workplace is the physical environment. Well, it's actually more than that, and especially today. We find that um, many times facilities who are developing the physical environment don't work in, in, and don't work together with the technology. But the technology is so important to everything that we do, whether it's our own end user computing or the audio visual that you find or you get your reservations for your conference room, and all of those things are components of a workplace that need to be integrated and thought of in parallel with the physical environment. Same thing goes with operations, as we've seen in the recent years of proliferation of, of, of things like food service in the, um, in, the, in the workplace. The operations team similarly needs to be working alongside the technology and the people who are not only building the facilities, but managing the facilities. But finally, it all comes down to the users. Users, the, the cost of your employees is the highest cost that you have. And we find that some of the most successful uh, companies actually have the facilities reporting up through HR. And so that becomes a, a complete team effort of how you approach a, a workplace of today. So what has happened in the last say, 15, 20 years that many corporations have gone from being very hierarchical to being flat. They've gone from being fragmented to being dynamic, siloed as opposed to less siloed. They've gone from, from being status oriented to being collaborative. And when that's been a sort of a democratization of the workplace where everyone has the access to the outdoor light, the light that comes in and they're not clogged up with private offices that the use of conference rooms, everybody's working on the same technology. They're usually working in the same kind of templated environment. And it brings a tremendous amount of equity. And we so have found that the 21st century workplace is all is, is really promoting a sense of social equity um, in the work. So what happens then? I mean, before COVID, we, we've already just gone from these, uh, these dark and dreary uh, workplaces that clog the windows or to something that is much more open and dynamic and friendly. And then after, and then post COVID, what happens? You've got families with two spouses working, homeschooling the kids and the dog can't leave you alone. And you don't have necessarily places to work. That's very different from somebody who's already set up to have a pretty good place to work. At the, edge of the, at the edge of the window, just as if you were in the office. So what has happened with the 21st century workplace? What, in terms of the metrics, we've seen that in using the same, same employee base, the total area has gone, has, has gone from, um, has gone from 100% to 33% less. So all of a sudden you've got, you've got a, a much smaller footprint to deal with, it's much denser. But how did that happen? really is a reallocation of the space that is dedicated to personal work, what we call the, the me space, has gone from 80% to an average of, of 47%. And the collaboration space, the we space, has gone from 12% to 35%. So you see a completely different metric. And then the, what we call the us space, which are the conference centers and other things, food, dining, um, has also increased, always, always squeezing the amount of personal space that people have in the office. The collaboration ratio, similar, has gone from four FTEs for one collaboration seat to almost a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. And that has created this activity-based workplace that, that Mark was speaking about. So now we find places that we do different functions within the same office, uh, places where we do our, our personal work, we think and we create, places where we collaborate with others informally and formally, uh, places where we learn, where we socialize, where we refresh, where we greet people from the outside. All of these need to be highly supported by the, by the technology and the uh, operations, as well as by the physical environment. So how do you program something with, that is that diverse and that, that is, is that way? We developed a few techniques that I think are very, have been very useful in planning these in the first place. And I think they're also useful in thinking about how we deal with a, a post-COVID situation. So for example, we, we often run topical workshops where we get cross-functional teams, people who run the business, 
change the business, people who run the work, workplace, the technology people, people, the employees, leaders. We bring them into a, a workshop where we're, we're focusing their attention, moving through the day in the life of the workplace. And we, we use a mnemonic devices like poems or AEIOU. Um, poems talks about people, the objects, the environment, the media, and the services. It sounds kind of corny, but if you walk through an entire office of how do you get your mail? How do you, how do you greet somebody coming into the office? And you start to think of all of those, those functions, you start to come up with a fairly robust understanding of all the things that need to happen, not only to design the workplace, but to, to operate it. And so when, when we think about all of those things, we're thinking of the end user all the time. So many of those are user experience workshops. So the Well Building Institute, um, has determined, has talks about what determines the state of health. And they've used this uh, diagram on, on the left that is coming from statistics the, that the CDC has developed about what is the, what, what creates health. The physical and social environment, look at how much that occupies. Lifestyle and health behaviors, how much that occupies. Much more than medical care or genetics. And so therefore they think that it's more than just design, it's how you operate and how you behave in that workplace that allows you to be healthful so for you. Now, well, uh, Building Institute is quite an interesting organization. Um, I often call it Lead for Humans. They, they have a, a developed a concepts. This is a, a, a recent development of, um, of the original seven group of seven uh, uh, functions that were important for human health and well-being in the environment. So uh, some of them are kind of obvious like air and water, nourishment, um, light, movement, thermal comfort, sound, materials, mind, your sense of well-being, your ability to focus, and, and community. And the Well Building Institute has a COVID-19 task force, and one of the members of our firm has participated in that all along. And they've come up using those well principles to talk about what, what in the COVID-19 has to be uh, looked at, promote clean contact. We know about that one. And that's everything from surfaces to how close you get the social distancing, improve the air quality. That's a big deal in offices. Talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, water quality, you manage the risk, you create organizational resilience, and in working from home and all the things that you need to do with me. But a lot of this has to do with resilience, recovery, We're hearing those things over and over and over. So what do you do in, an, in, a, in, a, in a workplace environment? Of course, we're always encouraging our clients to, to put in connecting stairs so people move throughout the workplace. Many times, like Mark said, the whole point of that is the casual collisions that you, you run into somebody, you start a conversation. Today, it's actually helpful for social distancing and you're not all crowded into an elevator. You start to be able to use, use those, those, those stairs, whether they're the fire stairs or actually a more elegant stair, um, it really doesn't matter, you're still, you're still moving. And so, Meeting social distancing guidelines in existing offices um, is, is something that we've all been focused on and Mark spent some time talking about that. The size of the workstation um, is, do you still checkerboard even if it's six by seven? Then glass separators, they're cleanable and they're sneeze guards in a sense for the office. Um, and you find alternative places to sit um, so that you're not, you can't, you don't have to always sit at your desk. Again, it's activity-based work, workplace but you're using it to your advantage in, in um, social distancing within the office. One-way circulation. With so many offices today having the, the, uh, the, the offices against the core and the glass open for the open offices, it actually does create logical pathways through. You can put environmental graphics within that or make it pretty clear how you, how you do that. And even in places where you have food service, um, you try to continue to make these cleanable surfaces, but also movable furniture. We've seen a big, a big push toward movable furniture, even in, in the areas of the workstation. And we don't actually think that one of the things that's going to come back that soon um, is, is the food service. Just like restaurants don't, don't have indoor dining in, in the workplace, that is going to become an issue. But you still can decentralize, bring your food from home, smaller pantries, a lot of devices like that can be done to minimize the, uh, the, the problem of contact. And again, for the flexible furniture for distancing, um, being able to go to an outdoor terrace that's adjacent to this multi-purpose room, move the tables and chairs around, uh, use technology, be able to collaborate from a distance with people in the room and people from far. 
we have seen in within a lot of the, uh, the, the firms that we've used that they've found cross-functional teams across the country who may solve problems for their clients by, by, by collaborating re remotely. And that actually has been a, a trend and McKinsey has talked about that a lot. And they tend to have, um, have, have a, less of a waterfall approach where you're solving a problem for a client and you send it over to legal or risk management. They go, no, 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 you gotta start all over again, go back to the beginning. And so these cross-functional teams come together and they work in real time. And so these collaboration spaces that are flexible allow them to do that. And just like Mark said, we, we have clients who um, were intending to be seated very densely. This happens to be um, a technology company where they work in an agile format and squads and teams and they, they st do morning stand up, they go do paired coding or some other work together and then they come back again later. So there's always this kind of flex and pull of a lot of places where they can actually physically get together to work or work on their own or have stand up. And what we've now seen is that even though they still work in those, we've created new, new paradigms of movable uh, tables, uh, these training tables and small places, uh, small places to get to work together, but really spread it out. So you're taking what would have been maybe 100% uh, occupancy to an 80 or even a 60% occupancy, whether they're coming to work every other, uh, every other day on shifts or, or whether they're gonna be there all, all at once. So now do we see, what do we see going forward in, in the planning? Um, we do a lot of real estate selection for, for, for clients. Uh, that help, I think architects are particularly good at doing that, to work, collaborate with a real estate broker, understand how the client, what the client is looking for, um, try, to, try to envision what they need to do. So everyone looks at the community where their office is going to be. Um, we used to look at the community providing amenities like food service that the, the, uh, the, the company wouldn't have to build. But now we're looking at community in a little bit different way. And the commute, uh, obviously, public transportation being somewhat dangerous. Uh, people are concerned about the commute and where they are. And some of our clients are saying, why put you know, 2,000 people in one building? Why not have four places? Uh, for 500 people, then you're not making it so dense and so dangerous. And some of the workplaces that we've been doing are 3,200 people, 4,000 people. And so that's, that's a lot of people to deal with. And so decentralization, I think, is going to, to happen. Also, the idea that the offices are moving away somewhat from being in urban environments to places where they can have outdoor access is an interesting phenomenon. But we often see, for example, in Washington, D.C., where there's a, uh, there are new uh, penthouse, occupiable penthouse rules from a zoning point of view, that we can repurpose rooftops. We take uh, an area that would be, uh, would have been the, the, the bulkhead mechanical room on the roof and develop a roof terrace and find ways to take public, to, uh, to take uh, assembly spaces and maybe open them up so you get the benefit of being able to go inside and outside in the interest of the, of the air. Of course, floor plate always important, but everybody's thinking more about the light, the air, the water quality, sustainability is, is always there, and resiliency. And the resiliency is not just, uh, will your computer start up again or will your emergency generator work, but resiliency is starting to become a corporate, a corporate concern. And how do you how do you survive something like COVID with your with your workforce? And how do you how do you do that? So the, 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 in terms of the physical environment, and that not just the, the, the place where you're located, again, we're going back to some of those things that the Well Building Institute and the COVID Task Force was talking about. How do you design it for clean contact? How do you lay it out? Walkability, how do you walk between floors? How do you walk outside? How do you use the, the whole environment? And how do you create all of these other places and the, the functions that we do. What are the core functions? What are the bathrooms? Uh, should the bathrooms be more dis, 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 dispersed? We often find you know, single sex um, uh, toilet rooms within the corporate environment outside the building core. So those kinds of things are starting to, to creep back into these conversations about the, the post COVID environment. And of course the workplace goals. I mean, we're finding that some clients, for example, who were technology companies that were very good at working 
uh, at, at working uh, together in a, in a place can work very, very just fine uh, remotely. Some of them don't intend to go back to the office again. They're gonna take their 400 employees and let them work from home. They will still have an office and what's that office gonna be? What are the things that people want to do? Well, the truth of the matter is, you know, you've got a spouse is working, you've got children at home, you've got your dog, you're narrowing the bandwidth in your house, you want to go in there to be, you can't wait to go back to the office, you can't wait to go there to socialize with your, with your friends and to, and to work, and sometimes, as, as Mark said, there are a variety of reasons why, why people do that, so we're, we're looking at that, and when we used to look at templated environments, where the furniture solution could change out from one work style, from one type of work style to another, to, to benching, to an agile team, to different things you can do. We're now seeing maybe some of those things actually go away and those are movable furniture and, and not simply the furniture that, that is, is always fixed. And of course, solutions of the furniture, um, operations, the technology is all there. So maybe the technology gets bigger. Maybe it's not individual technology. Maybe your collaboration is, is much larger this particular space has a, a terrace outside. You can go out, outside in here. You can have social events. You can move the furniture around. You can leverage the technology to, to, to work with everyone and, and have um, sometimes larger spaces. We have clients, for example, who are actually thinking about enlarging, enlarging their, their spaces vertically and not just horizontally to be able to get more air. We have one, one particular workplace now that wants to change the, um, the size of the ductwork on the buildings under construction to be able to increase the airflow. We have others that are changing things that, to make things more hands-free. We see a lot of hands-free technology uh, creeping into this. And if you're using a badge and you already have access to those things, you can get into the elevator, you can, you can purchase food on the vending machine, you can do a lot of things with that, you can open doors. Um, and so on. But finally, you know, the, the user experience and the personal growth is still where it is. And the confidence, uh, it is, as Mark said, it's, it's about confidence and, and, and well-being and a sense of well-being and your, your mental state of be, not being fearful of going into the office. And how do you, how do you get as a company explain that? You, a lot of communication, just like we have done some what is called change management when uh, clients would move their workforce from a more siloed environment to an open environment. Have to show them how to use the how to use the facilities, and and again in post COVID we have to do the same same thing again. But being able to go back into a situation where there's equity in the workplace, um, where you feel self fulfilled, where you can get the kind of mental and, and physical nourishment, where you're comfortable, um, safety and security. That is going to take more than simply the planning of the of the workplace more than the physical experience. It's gonna take all that technology, it's gonna leverage that technology and it's going to uh, rely on operations uh, and, a, and it's a big team. And I think that uh, it's actually kind of useful. It's a really interesting time where what is the office and what is the office going to be? So I'm gonna turn it back over to Ed who's gonna tell us a little bit more about what he, where he thinks the future of the, the workplace is likely to go. I'm hoping hey, everybody can hear me now. Okay, great. Sorry about that technology. What can I tell you? <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, so hopefully what's been great about this, con this conference and this discussion so far, and especially working with Mark and Karen, is, is that what we've been trying to do is elevate, I think, you know, the topic to really not just talk about, you know, interiors and whatnot, but to really talk about what is the nature of work what is the nature of the workplace? How do we respond as designers to that inherent idea? And so I wanna take that a little bit further and talk a little bit about how work itself is changing, changing within a different kind of economy. And this is an idea that what we've been finding is that with COVID, COVID 
didn't produce change. COVID acceler accelerated change that was already happening. And this is an area of change in the economy that we really are seeing beginning in a very strong way now, thanks to COVID. I'm gonna walk you through that. It's the idea of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, a fellow by the name of Klaus Schraub uh, developed the idea. He's with the World Economic Forum. It's really defined around this idea that we have advanced technology so much that now we have a bit of a fusion between the physical, the digital, digital and the biological realms. And when that fusion happens, there is just new ways to create things, new ways to do things that are going to accelerate a different kind of economy. And work, the workplace and the worker in this economy is no longer the, the person who sits in an ergonomic cubicle and waits for their sneakers to arrive from China. No, in this kind of an economy, something different happens. The worker now is engaged with the idea of innovating what that sneaker is. They're designing that sneaker. They're figuring out how to prototype it. They're putting it into pilot and they're then immediately putting into manufacturing. And that sneaker just isn't a sneaker. That sneaker is there to help you run better, to track how you're doing, to see your health and to give you information. And the other thing about that sneaker, it's highly personalized. It's designed specifically for you, the customer in a very localized way. The thing about that is, is that that is industry that is inherently localized. So that's the thing that's beginning to happen in this, in this fourth industrial revolution. We're moving away from the trade services of the third industrial revolution that was built around communication. This is built around something else. What are the evidences of that happening? Well, look outside your window. And yes, you see snow, at least I do anyway, and it's, it's beautiful, it's great to have a snow day, right? But beyond that, my guess is you're looking at a lot of vehicles right now that are coming down your street and bringing goods to your neighbors. And those goods are pretty, yes, they're the sneakers, but they're also food. They're also the things that we need. We are obtaining our goods in ways that are entirely different. The graph that you see in front of you has been the percentage of e-commerce that began in 2005 up until today. Look at the final graph, right? How rapidly that is increasing. We think that that's a change that's gonna stay because there's been a lot of development that's happening around that. Now, will it, will it continue to change in that, in that amount? Of course not. But even if it followed the curve from before, it indicates a rapid change. That's an indicator of a changed economy. And where is that coming from? So first is the growth of e-commerce, but where is it coming from? In places like this. These are not places that are dumb warehouses that are serving you know, big box stores. These are places where people work 3,000 people work in places that are like this. They deserve, deserve good, human, supportive workplaces that help them to do their jobs in this new economy. And that's just the beginning because this is where maybe goods are coming from, but soon there will also be where our goods are made. And there's of course been changes to infrastructure around us. Again, look outside your window. It's not the 53 foot trailer that's rolling down the highway anymore. These are the kinds of things that we're beginning to see integrated into our community and our infrastructure is working around it. So these are electrified vehicles. They're fleet vehicles that are smaller. They can work their way into cities a lot more nimbly than they were in the past. And yes, some of them are even become, becoming self-driving vehicles. Those are the kinds of infrastructure changes are, that are really beginning to happen, that are enabling this whole other way for us to receive our goods. And the other thing that's really beginning to happen is this idea of resilience. You know, it's interesting, we developed this graph in, in our research in 2013, and we predicted a change that was going to happen in the trade that where it would become move its way back to production in North America, largely based upon looking at energy and the use of energy. So sustainability was gonna drive it. We predicted in 2020, a point of inflection would have happened. Who would have known it would have been COVID that caused it. But here's the really interesting thing. It's not just about sustainability anymore, it's about resilience. When we hit the beginning of the COVID crisis, most of our medical goods were held in China because they couldn't get them out. So all of our medical service goods, even our medicines themselves were coming from overseas. That's not a resilient supply chain. A resilient supply chain works inherently differently and locally. The next thing is, is that is promoting a shift in policy. You're seeing that now in the, in the new administration that's about to come in, look at, the, look at their economic advisors. They're beginning to look at how industry reorients itself back into the US. So not just any industry, industry that meets this new paradigm. So these are all forces that are beginning to make for a change. And what we are beginning to experience is that cities are embracing that change. 
We're doing an extraordinary amount of work right now in the boroughs in New York City. They are incredibly embracing of this as an idea. So we're, we're no longer taking the zoning approach on the left where the whole world is divided into industry way out over there and retail over here and we live over there. No, we're moving into New York City environments where all of this is coming together, where we literally can bring all of these kinds of things together in a new kind of economy. So already regulation is beginning to shift and that is creating opportunities. Now, you might think that, okay, this is just an architect saying this stuff, right? And that there really isn't all this diverse stuff. Well, look at this company, you may recognize it. Of course, it's where probably a lot of us spend our money these days. My wife is wondering when she sees her account, what is all this Amazon stuff that is coming my way, right? So Amazon is a big part of what we do. This is the new company. But here's the thing to pay attention to it. These are graph, by the way, as to their businesses and where they receive their income. The big blue chunk is, of course, where they do most of their work in, in online sales. But here's the really interesting thing. It has the least margin of all of the areas of business. They're involved in web services. They're in, involved in producing content. Look at your TV, right? They're also engaging with other smaller third-party sellers, which indicates, again, the localization of content and product. And all of these together work as a myriad that is really, really focused on the customer. That's Amazon. It's not just a place that we receive our goods from. It is a, it is a paradigm. It is a model for the new economic paradigm. What we're suggesting is that's what you designed for. That's the new economy. That's the new workplace. Okay, so what might that look like? Let's first deal with it on kind of a larger kind of a context, right? Well, think about it. If we no longer have a zoning approach that takes all these things and separates them, but brings them all together. And if companies themselves are organized around the idea of those things coming together, then why not do it architecturally? And by the way, we're starting to do this. So all of a sudden industry itself is based upon distribution and manufacturing, retail. Hey, Ikea, think about it. It's pretty much the same sort of thing. We're even designing event spaces, studio spaces that integrate themselves into it. Because part of the content that's being created is not just the goods that you buy, but it's the things that you see and you experience as well. And education has always been a component to this thing. So there are different kind of ecosystems that begin to happen. We just gathered some of them together to demonstrate that what they could be. I'll give you an example of the creative ecosystem is something my daughter, who's an industrial designer, works in. So she is designing, she's immediately next to the plant where it's manufactured, she designs dog toys and whatnot, by the way, that's a blast, blast of a time doing it. Um, she lives very close by. Um, they are very quickly prototyping her ideas, getting feedback. They actually bring customers to that plant to, in order to get some immediate feedback. And at the same time, they're distributing from a location that's very close. It's a very tight ecosystem. So these things already happen and they're allowing innovation to happen at an incredible pace. So what does it look like in architecture? This is a proposal that we did um, for uh, Sunset Park in Brooklyn. Of course, Brooklyn has a long history of being a manufacturing center. We're, we're saying let's elevate and bring it back into this new economy. So here was the idea. It, if you look, what you're going to see is that it's an industrial base. There's these beautiful old brick industrial buildings there that are really cool places to work in. So we said repurpose those into being creative spaces. They'll support all the kinds of ideas that, that Mark and Karen were talking about. But then let's build right next to it a way to connect back and into the city to bring public space that allows it to come in, allows the public to come back over to the waterfront. And what's adjacent to it? Of course, there's retail adjacent to it that is served by the industrial spaces that are up, up above and below that as a very well worked out shipping and receiving um, distribution network that brings all of those goods into Brooklyn where there's an extraordinary customer base. So it's a kind of a concept that brings all of that together. Our point is that we believe that this responds to the new kind of economy and the workplace that it will demand. And where is it happening? This was also interesting. So we spent some time researching and heat mapping a couple of things that overlapped on top of one another. Where was this industry starting to emerge? And where was population increasing? They coalesced, which kind of reinforced the idea that really it is a labor-oriented industry now, not just a goods-oriented industry, a labor-oriented industry. So that's what you have to design around. Another interesting thing, look at the cities. They're more tertiary cities. 
A lot of these are old manufacturing cities. It's a way of bringing that back. So the United States is still urbanized, but it's really wonderful to see that the urban areas that are growing aren't just places like New York City, but there are other places in smaller cities that allow for urban, really successful urban environments. And that's the, where we'll be designing this new integrated workplace. But the precursor to it isn't what I showed you a minute ago. The precursor to all of this has been education. So the project on the right is a, a project that we did with HWKN a few years ago. It, it's the Penovation Building for University of Pennsylvania. Um, what's very interesting about it is this is where uh, entrepreneurial businesses come together with the students and together they work in workshops that are often light manufacturing based or research based. So the engineering department belongs here as well. So already you're beginning to see education shifting itself towards this new economy that is also about the making of things that are very unique and very organized and around individuals and supportive of individuals as well. That, that's where it's coming from. We did a second building for them, and this is in collaboration with Wharton as well, where the same sort of things are beginning to happen. Right, so there's a tower we're just finishing right now in Philadelphia, where these are labs that bring together everything from test kitchens to light manufacturing to making maker space, all integrated into the educational environment. These are the people graduating now that are gonna feed the workplace of the future. And the kinds of environments that they're gonna want are not their cubicle. They want in the places where they can build and make and create things. So it leads to a different kind of an economy and a different kind of place to work. So all the time that there is this kind of a change in the economy, there are things that happen that propel it forward. In 1911, there was one of those changes. So this was kind of the big beginning of what they would call the second industrial revolution, the idea of mass production. And this is a place where in New York City on Columbus, pardon me, on Washington Square, um, that there, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. And essentially, as you can see, as many women working in the creation of garments. Uh, and they were on an upper floor in a building in New York City. Unfortunately, what had happened was the, um, exits had all been blocked because they didn't want people just taking off and doing their own thing. These are women who work 12 hour days uh, in order to produce these goods. Somebody inadvertently put a cigarette or something like that in one of the cotton bins and it ignited. Unfortunately, what happened to it is it was so high the fire department couldn't reach them because the exits were blocked already. The flames engulfed the exits and they couldn't get out. As a result, 142 people died, most of them women, 42 people jumped, pardon me, 47 people jumped to their death. This caused an extraordinary change, extraordinary change in regulation around workplace and the work day. Um, the, I, now that we've, we can thank to a five day work day because of the reaction to what happened here. Workplace standards that said, no, you have to have exits. You have to have break time. All of that, all of those change in regulation happen in response to this unfortunate, terrible, terrible tragedy. What I'm saying is we have a new fire today. And that fire is COVID. Again, it's not making change, but it's accelerating change. And COVID's happening and it's making us aware of where people work and people in that new economy. Remember the place I showed you in the beginning? This is their workplace. These are the work frontline workers too that are making sure that we get the goods that we need. And there have been unfortunate events that have led to lack of health, in some cases, extreme um, uh, injury that it's caused because no one's paid attention to the design of the workplace. Now, to Amazon's credit, they've done a lot of things to change their policies to prevent these kinds of things from happen. But I'm saying that we have a role as designers to take that on and to make for a new workplace, a better workplace that deals with these kinds of workers in our new economy. So what are we doing? So we've been doing this for some of our clients. We've also recently won a research grant to begin to look at well, you know, you've already heard it uh, with Mark and Karen. Why not apply those exact same principles to a more industrial based workplace, especially if the percentage of our workers right now are increasing exponentially in this area compared to any other place to work. You can use exact same principles, but you know what we learned, you gotta apply them differently. So how do we apply them differently? So for example, we learned earlier about taking breaks 
you really need to take breaks. But what are the nature of those breaks? When you're in an office environment, there's a certain kind of break you need to take. You're staring at your computer all day. You need to get away from it. You need to meet with others. You need to have a refreshment to get away from it. But that's because everybody's working in pretty much the same way. Not so here, right? So there are workers here doing extreme physical work. And what do they need? They need to literally take a rest in order for their body to recover from the work that they're doing. Then there are other workers who are doing repetitive work. Interestingly enough, what we found was to give them a rest, you actually need to create game rooms, puzzle rooms, and things like that that allow them to engage their brain in ways that are different than repetitive work. Another thing about the, these is that there is technology that accompanies people, doesn't replace them. It accompanies them, helps them do their jobs better so that they can find goods and whatnot in these extraordinary places that much easier. But it has an interesting effect. It isolates people, even though it's a huge place and there are 3,000 people there. Sometimes they're isolated. So the idea of creating centers like this that bring people together at regular intervals allows them to break that way of working. It's the new kind of workplace, but it follows the same kind of principles. So already we've talked about biophilic design. That's really important here. We're looking at lighting. How does it change the circadian rhythms? Sometimes people work at night. How do you literally bring the experience of working in the evening back and into this environment? Color, signage, location, where I get water, all ties back to how I make a good workplace. It follows the exact same principles that Mark and Karen were talking about in the traditional workplace, but it adapts them to different kinds of environments. Our point, this is the kind of new workplace that we as designers are going to be engaging in. Yes, we will continue to have office workplaces, but they will also be engaged around this idea of making. And the kinds of things that we're gonna create for them and the way that they collaborate is different. And then there's industry itself. Industry itself that needs to be a dignified workplace because that's where we're gonna work. That's where many of the people that we have are going to work. And that's a new kind of workplace that we're evolving uh, for um, the, the fourth industrial revolution. So I'll stop there. And I think that we're done. <laughs> but now we're open to questions. Thank you so very much, Ed. Um, I have to tell you, I'm so impressed with the innovation that all three of you presented today. I know that it sparked a lot of I, I new ideas in my imagination, and I hope it did also for our audience today. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please type it into the Q&A and we can um, offer it up to our uh, speakers today. Stephen Schlock is uh, saying how excellent all of your presentations were. And let's see if we have any questions coming in. Noreen Rockford, this has been an exciting presentation. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, I just want to mention that the registration for the 2021 um, post-pandemic webinars is not out yet. We're working on that right now. So you should look for that in the beginning of January. Um, and our programs, we will be having one a month instead of one every two weeks. So you'll have a little bit more time between to get your registration in order. So keep an eye out for that coming in the new year. I don't have any questions coming in from our audience. We'll just take, uh, here we go. Uh, from Ron Weston, uh, will the land use approval process impede the new mixed use workplace models Ed described? Um, so I, I would say the answer is no. Um, it has been challenging though. So uh, more and more the idea is as these become labor oriented kinds of places as industry focuses on labor and as industry comes back into communities, they're on familiar with it, right? And let's be honest, in industry of the past didn't have the best of reputations. Uh, we're building on some of the, reclaiming some of the lands that they didn't leave that so well. Uh, but I'll tell you that when you begin to engage a community around this conversation, attitudes begin to change. Uh, moreover, as the increased amount of populations in communities start to work in industry again, those attitudes begin to change. 
So yeah, it requires you to do more work, which is what we should be doing, right? So um, in order to really bring it into communities, but, um, but what we have found is as you go through that process, it can be successful and it is successful. It just takes more time. David Crawford, housing integration wasn't mentioned today. Any comments on that? Housing has a significant component in the things that we're talking about. We're actually working on a project that has an industrial base with housing component as an out, uh, outdoor component as well. So yeah, I mean, the whole notion of worker housing is really important. And I think that, um, you know, even, even the degree to which I'm, I'm sure Mark and Karen would say that it's the integration of the workplace. I, I think as it, Karen was talking about the breaking down the smaller things, I can imagine that integrating with housing well. I'll, I'll let you speak to that, Mark, Karen. Karen or Mark, do you want to give any follow up on that or any of the questions? Sure, I, I do think I do think that um, as as companies that tried to centralize now are thinking maybe they want to decentralize. Whenever we're looking at real estate, we're always doing commute studies. Where is everybody coming from? Where do they want to be? How are they going to get there? And in, in some places, like in Texas, there isn't public transportation, so it's always the car. Um, and then other places like Metro DC, everybody's looking to where can you use the uh, public transportation to get there. But I think housing, the location of housing and the real estate selection and, and so on is, is gets to be really important. And people like to, to live near where they work. I mean, I live three blocks from my office, so I'm, I'm thinking that's pretty good. But that, so that there's a lot of a c connection of, between the, the uses that are coming out in, in land use and land use plans um, and variety of many of them smaller cities um, as well as some of the, the larger cities. So I think that's pretty healthy. Thank you, Karen. And, I, uh, and just off of what Karen said, of I, totally, I totally agree. And I think that's what COVID has taught us is that because we're working in our own environments, we're comfortable and we're surrounded by the things that feel comforting to us, certainly challenging at times, but it's helped us to understand what might need to be in place of, a, of an working environment. What can we take away from our home environments that really is the lifeline for us. That really, you know, gets us charged in the morning. That has a place more of a permanent factor in our uh, in our office setting. So again, it's knowledge is power, and I think we can certainly start to leverage that in a in a commercial environment. Uh, from Steve Lazarus, I know you mentioned air quality, air exchanges, but to me, this is extremely important. What do you feel there? are new ideas on how to do this. Mark, you were talking about that the other day. Is that yeah. a question you could answer? Yeah. This is a very Karen, interesting. Karen, you have a little bit of feedback. If you could mute when you're not speaking, I think that would help. This is a really interesting one and it's delicate. Um, it's delicate from the perspective of what does the environment have and what is it able to do versus not. So of an existing building, we would look to understand what kind of a system is it? What is it capable of doing? What's the, the life expectancy of the system? Uh, what are the occupants it needs to provide safety for? And at the end of that whole analysis discovery, we will then come up with how to best position a solution. It could be that the system just needs a minor uh, financial outlay to get it to what it needs to do in the future or it could be that it's outdated, the building isn't you know, providing any financial support, any TI allowance, as they say, for companies, whether they're in a multi-story building or a single occupant tenant, to invest in getting the system where it needs to be, that it, it opens up the door for a lot of the things that Ed was alluding to in his presentation about a relocation. Perhaps it's what's you know, kind of been in the vocabulary of a hub and spoke model where there's more locations around urban environments. So again, it's really leveraging and understanding what does the systems need to do based on the population and percentages that would look to feel comforted uh, by what it can do, if that makes some sense. Anybody else have a comment on this question?
Okay, I have a question from Thomas Haggerty. You see any increased client's ability to make changes in the future, such as the use of demountable partitions to be able to make changes in response to future pandemics or the like? Absolutely. I, I think that the whole idea of flexibility has got a new meaning. Um, and, and it's got a meaning for all of us. And then and, and, and where we used to just, like I said in the, in the presentation, think about modularity, because you might take one fixed um, furniture system and replace it with a different style of fixed furniture system, but on the same grid. So you're changing out, you're changing out the furniture, you're not renovating and tearing down walls and changing the HVAC, etc. Well, the, the, the whole idea of temporary measures is, is, and, and flexibility of how you move things around. I think you're gonna see a lot more mobile, mobile furniture. Um, we've already seen in these agile environments where people use uh, mobile whiteboards uh, for their stand-up and they, they sometimes are, have monitors on them and other things. And now they're, they're actually used as partitions to, to separate one, one area from another. Uh, we did see the lowering of all the cubicles and the walls and, and we've always used glass in those, in those cases so that you maintain the visibility, you have seated privacy, but when you're standing up, you don't have that. But I think they're, I think they're gonna go up again, but go up in glass. And so I think there's gonna be a few temporary things like that that we'll see in the furniture, furniture side. You know, Karen, you bring up the agile system, which I know is a, a management system as well, um, and it has a, a distinct design response, I think, which you've, you've brought to the table. Uh, what's, what I'm finding interestingly in, in the kind of new economic thing that we were talking about, it's very, those practices are very supported in that kind of thinking. So, and they're happening in workplaces, just as you described, design places like we all live in. And, um, the, and also where they make things and distribute things, teams work together in these kind of cross collaborative ways that come together quickly and work through agile kinds of systems. So I think that Agile itself, um, and Agile has been a wonderful way to adapt even through COVID. Um, you know, we deploy it, I know, in the office, right? Because you have to bring people together somehow and it works really particularly well. So I think that there's another thing in that too, in the design of the workplace across the board, working around those principles as well. And it's adaptability is, I think, key to that as well. I agree with you. Yeah, and I think what's interesting about that is that, that you used to see it only in software companies, and now you see it right. in, in, in real corporate functions that were once quite quite different, and that the cross-functional teams now no longer using this uh, waterfall approach of, of making decisions and, and coming up with solutions, but but actually collaborating in real time um, uh, across functional is it's, it's a it's a tremendous thing, and it, and it does play into the whole idea of of mixed uses um, on site as well as uh, surrounding. I agree. Them. I agree. A uh, question from Kim Bunn. Has there been investigation in some of these office planning environments for larger operable windows or doors to open offices and spaces to outdoor air or incorporation of courtyards or exterior spaces into the design? Uh, yes, in our, in, our, in our view, yes. A couple of times we've um, looked at um, uh, big operable windows uh, in the, uh, on the upper levels of, of, um, of offices in, in, in DC, for example, where they, they now can occupy the penthouses and you have certain kinds of setbacks so you can go in and out. And it's, it's always a challenge. There's always the, the HVAC question, and then there's the, the birds and the bugs coming in and all kinds of other things. But yes, I think there's more of a, a move to that. And, and even if you have terraces you can step out on uh, around the perimeter of a building, it's not unusual to find, find more and more and more of that. Yeah, even in larger scale applications, I, I agree. You know, we're, we're trying to take advantage more and more of the large open space that we need to develop for things like um, uh, stormwater management and, and transforming them into places where, where people can be and to use. Uh, and the idea of um, using passive systems where large open doors and things like that can actually uh, be part of the conditioning system is, is gaining a lot of acceptance on top of the fact that it's just, it's very biophilic. I mean, you literally hear what's going on outside, right? And see it and feel it. And um, it's become a, another aspect of the well uh, design that we're trying to bring into to the design of those spaces. From Noreen Rockford, COVID-19 has made the sanitizing of our environments essential. How do you see that affecting the material selection of interior partitions and furniture? Uh, 
I'll start it off by saying it, it's a certainly a great question. You know, one of the things we think about as as designers is what are the surfaces meant to withstand? How do we clean them? So when we're kind of dancing around the conversation of change management, and, and Karen had said it about you know educating and helping to understand how to maintain, how to use, how to transition, we certainly want to make sure that our surfaces, our substrates, are not being overly cleaned and starting to break down the inherent characteristics that it was created to withstand. So I, I think I may mention that. I feel hand sanitizers, the ability to really keep yourself clean throughout the day is more of a lifelong effort in our environment. But we need to understand and really look closely at what are the materials needed to support the functions and where do they reside and how do we min maintain and manage them? So it's almost like this bit of a life cycle to then solution, okay, based on everything we, we talked about and understand, this is the best solution for you because. So we, do, we need to start to really think about it as a life cycle and not make assumptions that a hard surface needs to be solid surface or composite. You know, maybe it doesn't. Um, partitions need to be fabric. Maybe it can't. Maybe it's not the best vehicle to do that for certain reasons. So we, we need to think about it more in a holistic fashion. Um, what is so great is that as technology, as innovation keeps thriving, there are so many materials now available to us in new ways for us to really leverage new ways in th terms of how we could exercise in, them in our environment. So, and with that comes easier ways to maintain them, um, keep them functional really. So uh, again, off of what uh, Ed and Karen had said, COVID has really propelled us and, and helped us to Kind of shake things up a bit and reimagine them in a different way for all of our sake. Okay, we don't have any more questions at this time. I want to thank all of our presenters. Uh, really, a very, very exciting presentation, and I can't wait to see the work uh, that all three of your firms have uh, flowing out over the next months and years. I want to thank our audience. We had a robust attendance again today. Reminder that we do have a continuation of this series coming up in 2021. So please watch your email and social media for that. Uh, follow AIA New Jersey on YouTube to see recordings of our previous programs. And uh, we wish all of you a safe and healthy holiday. I hope you get a little bit of a break. Um, this is our last program of 2020. And uh, we've had more continuing education offer this year than in all the years I've been a member, I think. So I hope you've had the opportunity to take advantage and continue to stay with us into next year. Thank you all for participating. Have a great day.